Hello and welcome back to the Stay Sure Wellbeing YouTube channel. I'm Dr Dawn Harper and today I'm going to be talking about cervical cancer and the NHS cervical screening programme. So let's start with what is the cervix. The cervix is the neck of the womb. It can be felt at the top of the vagina. It feels a little bit like the tip of your nose in consistency. And when a woman attends for a cervical smear, the nurse or doctor taking the smear will be collecting some cells from the cervix to be examined under a microscope in the laboratory to look for subtle changes, which if left untreated or monitored could over a period of years become cancerous. So the cervical screening programme is available on the NHS. It's free to all women registered with an NHS GP and provided you are registered with an NHS doctor, you will be automatically called sometime around your 25th birthday for your first smear. You will then be called every three years until the age of 49, where the frequency reduces to every five years until the age of 64. And then the screening programme stops unless you've had recent abnormal smears or you've not previously been for a smear, in which case you may still be called over the age of 65. And women who have abnormality, abnormalities on their smear results may be asked to attend more frequently. So what causes cervical cancer? The vast majority, nearly all cervical cancers, are caused by an infection with human papillomavirus, also known as HPV. Now there are over a hundred different types of HPV, some cause things like common warts and verrucas on our hands and feet, but there are four types that can cause changes to the cells of the cervix which ultimately could lead to a cancer. And types 16 and 18 are the biggest culprits. We don't fully understand why some women are susceptible to these changes and others aren't. Virtually all sexually active human beings will be exposed to HPV. It's prolific and it doesn't cause symptoms like a discharge, which you might expect, for example, from something like chlamydia or gonorrhea. So you may be exposed to HPV and have absolutely no idea. You won't get symptoms, but you can then pass it between other sexual partners. And you don't have to have full penetrative sex in order to pass HPV on. Skin to skin contact or using things like sex toys can be enough to pass the virus on. As I say, most of us will clear the virus and never know we've had it and never have a problem. We don't fully understand why those that do develop problems do so, but we do know that smoking does increase that risk. So the two most important things that you can do to protect yourself from cervical cancer are always attend when you're called for your cervical smear. And if you need another reason to give up smoking, perhaps now is the time to have a look at your local smoking cessation clinics and promise yourself that this time you'll do it. We also, of course, now have the vaccine which is available to school, school girls. Uh, and again, I would encourage anyone whose daughter or a friend of the family that you know who's offered this vaccine, please do take it up. It protects against the four strains of HPV most likely to cause cervical cancer. And really cervical cancer in 2021 should be a completely preventable disease. I'm often asked why we don't call women in England until 25, because we used to call everybody over the age of 21. And actually the change was made a few years ago on advice from Cancer Research UK, not because of any financial or political decision. And it's thought that what was happening is we were getting a lot of minor abnormalities in the younger women between 21 and 25. We think that's probably because the cervix was still developing. But of course, those abnormalities caused a great deal of angst. Sometimes they needed treatment which might have removed part of the tissue of the cervix which can then lead to problems with fertility later in life. And so because cervical cancer is incredibly rare under the age of 25, it was decided to increase the age when we routinely call people for a smear test. But one thing I want to make really, really clear here today is that doesn't mean that you should ignore 
the sorts of symptoms that could be attributed to cervical cancer. So whether I'm talking to you or somebody that you know who is under the age of 25, it is really, really important that if you have any abnormal bleeding, whether it's bleeding between periods, whether it's a complete change to your periods, whether it's bleeding after intercourse or an abnormal vaginal discharge, your doctor wants to know. They wouldn't necessarily do a smear at that point, they would immediately send you up to the hospital if they've ruled out other much more common things like a missed pill, for example, or sometimes an infection like gonorrhea or chlamydia, which can cause that abnormal bleeding. But please don't ever, ever ignore those symptoms. I'm often asked as well about whether or not it's appropriate for, for example, lesbian women uh, to have a smear and we always say yes please if you are invited please always take that opportunity. Um, it is important if you've ever had any heterosexual contact and of course you only need to have one sexual contact whenever, maybe years ago and that increases your risk. The more sexual contacts the more partners you have then the, the higher your risk but really important that if you've ever had a heterosexual contact that you do attend for your smears. But also to remember that this virus can be passed through skin to skin contact and via sex toys. So really important that you protect your health. Another common question is whether or not you need a cervical smear if you've had a hysterectomy. And this rather depends on the type of hysterectomy you've had and why you had that hysterectomy. The vast majority of hysterectomies are what we call total abdominal hysterectomies, where the whole of the uterus, including the neck of the womb, are removed, in which case there is no cervix, so there is nothing there to smear. And if that's what you've had for most reasons, then you probably no longer need to attend the cervical screening programme and your doctor can fill in the appropriate paperwork. However, if that total abdominal hysterectomy was performed because of cancer, then you may well be asked to attend for what we call a vault smear, which is a very similar process, which I'll talk you through in just a moment. And, uh, and they will just take some cells from where the cervix used to be to check that everything is healthy. Now, many years ago, um, I was the only female doctor in a seven doctor practice. I, it was before nurses did a lot of the smears. So you can imagine I did an awful lot of smears and I was in charge of doing all the follow up, follow -up letters. And we had a significant number of women who never, ever, ever wanted to come for a smear test. And try as I might, write to them, phone them, I couldn't persuade them. There was a story, I'm not a great watcher of soap operas, but there was a story, I think it was in Coronation Street, of a lady who had a, an abnormal smear test and she died of cervical cancer in a very short period afterwards. And the medical profession were up in arms. There were letters written in the open press and in the British Medical Journal saying that this was a really irresponsible storyline because that's not the way that, that cervical cancer behaves. But actually, we probably all had to bite our tongues because what happened was that so-called irresponsible storyline brought women flooding out of the woodwork saying that they needed their smears, people who we could never get to come in and have a smear. Uh, to the point that we had a, a huge delay actually in results. So rather than your results coming back in two or three weeks, they were tending to be six or maybe even eight weeks because the lab had such a backlog. And those women that were coming in to see me for a smear, almost to a woman, once I'd taken the smear, said, is that it? And I think sometimes there have been such horrible stories talked about smears, you hear words like scrape, there's no scraping involved at all. When you go for a smear test, you will be offered a chaperone if you'd like to take somebody with you or have somebody else in the room with you. Uh, you will be asked to lay on the couch, usually on your back, or you may be asked to lie on your left-hand side with your knees curled up. If you're on your back, you'll be asked to draw your ankles up towards your bottom and just to let your legs relax open. It may not be the easiest position in which to relax, but the more relaxed you are, the easier it is technically for the doctor or nurse to take the smear and therefore the more comfortable it will be for you. We know that every woman's womb is slightly tilted. Three quarters of wombs are tilted forward and that usually means that the cervix is easier to see. If you have a, a womb that's tilted back, if you're the one in four women that have a, a what we call retroverted uterus, you may be asked to slip your hands under your bottom, which tilts your pelvis up a little bit and just makes it easier 
for the doctor to take the smear. They take the smear with a very soft plastic brush that you shouldn't be aware of what is happening. They simply introduce something called a speculum, which looks a little bit like a duck's beak, and they open that up so that they can see the cervix and then sweep this brush around the cervix a few times before popping it into a pot and sending off to the lab. Really important that you know when you leave that appointment how and when you are supposed to get your results. Most people will find that they are written to by the central laboratory but just make sure that that is the scenario for you and that the onus isn't on you to, uh, to follow that result up. And as I say, for the vast majority it's a five minute appointment, it's, it's, it shouldn't be uncomfortable. Uh, like I've just told you, all those women who said to me, is that it? So it really is a five minute test that could save your life. The vast majority of results will come back normally. Uh, occasionally, and it's more common in peri and postmenopausal women, occasionally we will have a result which comes back saying that the result is deemed inadequate. <clears throat> And what that means is the cells that they've seen were normal, they haven't seen anything worrying, but they haven't seen enough cells. And that can be a feature of the fact that the, uh, there is not enough oestrogen around and the tissues are a little bit thin and your doctor will advise on what to do before you come back for a follow-up. The follow-up will be at three months and people often worry that that's too long to leave it, but it takes that long for the cervix to recover for us to get a new sample. Um, and the other thing just to say, if you are still menstruating and you're called for your appointment, if you are bleeding at the time of the appointment or you know that you will be, please phone and rearrange that appointment. We don't mind examining you if you're bleeding at all. People, women often say to me, oh, this, this is awful, do you mind doing this? And of course we don't, it's all in a day's work. But if there is a lot of blood around, it can sometimes obscure what the uh, lab technicians are looking at when they are looking at the result. And so they can't see enough cells properly. So if you know you're going to be bleeding, just rearrange your smear test for a time, perhaps a couple of weeks after your period when you know that you won't be bleeding. <clears throat> and just to reassure you, smear results are looked at independently by two different specialists in the laboratory to make sure that they are really thoroughly examined. So if you get a normal result, you can put that to bed for three or five years, however long it is, depending on your age, knowing that you've done that five minute appointment that could potentially save your life. So I hope that's reassured you about uh, what to look out for, what to expect from a smear test and why it's so important to attend when you're invited. That's it from me for today. So until next time, stay safe and stay well. And as always, do let me know if there's anything that you would like discussed on this channel, please message me here or drop me an email on the website and I'd be delighted to hear what you want me to talk about. Until then, goodbye.